Now we are recording. Hello, this is June 23rd, and I am Samuel from Traders Insight. Welcome to the show. I'm here with uh, Matt. Hey, guys. And Matt, he, our, uh, our resident traders here. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Uh, most importantly, let's, let's start with this letter. Letter to the American Consumer, published in the Wall Street Journal yesterday uh, by John Hilsenrath, who is essentially the Fed spokesman. And I, I, I'm just going to read this for you. because I, I just think it sums up everything about the Fed. 100% just sums it up. Right. Okay. Well, Matt, have you, have you read this letter yet? I haven't actually. No, okay. no. I'm well, interested to hear. Let me, let me read this for you. Okay. Yeah. Dear American Consumer, this is the Wall Street Journal. We're writing to ask if something is bothering you. The sun shined in April, and you didn't spend much money. The Commerce Department here in Washington says your spending didn't increase at all, adjusted for inflation last month compared to March. You appear to mostly have stayed at home and watched television in December, January, and February as well. We thought you would be out of your winter doldrums by now, but we don't see much evidence that this is the case. You've been saving more, too. As a shock, <laughs> you stopped away. <laughs> you stopped away 5.6 percent of your income in April after taxes. Even more in March. This saving is not like you. What's up? I mean, maybe they're just scared of going outside in case that shot does something. <laughs> Why aren't you being more responsible, America? <laughs> yeah, take out more debt. We know you experienced a terrible shock when Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008, and your employers responded by firing you. <laughs> So it's a cheery letter. Yep. We know stock prices collapsed, and that was shocking too. <laughs> we also know you shouldn't have taken out that large second mortgage during the housing boom to fix up your kitchen with granite countertops. <laughs> and you've been working very hard to pay off this debt, and we admire your fortitude. But these shocks seem like a long time ago to us in the newsroom. Is that still what holding you back? I mean, this guy just makes me sick. Yeah. 100% sick. Sick. I mean, this is everything that's wrong with America today. Like, well, it's not everything. There's a lot more. At least for monetary <laughs> policy, this kind of like disconnect between this, you know, just a guy, a guy who has no connection to normal, average American working people and the hardships that they had to go through in the last recession, right? And that they're still stuck with today because we really haven't had a recovery. It's been a tepid, a tepid, like not even a recession, just tepid, just downward trend ever since the ever since two thousand. Yeah, I mean, consumers got hit because they were pretty much doing what the Fed was bloody telling them to do, and now they're coming back and saying you shouldn't have done it. Yeah, and here we have here we have a guy coming out and saying, we at the Fed caused Lehman Brothers. Well, we at the Fed gave Lehman Brothers the tools for collapse in two thousand eight. Which ended up with you being fired from your job and having to go on benefits, sometimes up for, what, 99 weeks, right? 99 yeah. weekers, that people that just get to the end of 99 weeks and can't take unemployment anymore. We got you fired. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. <laughs> we, we didn't want the stock market to crash, but <laughs> it I mean, did. <laughs> but it did. Because we didn't have a clue of what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> And and we also gave you we also like we also drove interest rates into the ground so you take these these fucking like zero percent interest rates and refinance your home and and put in your new kitchen right and we so, didn't make sure the banks were they running themselves properly handing out actually liable reliable credit yeah I mean I remember I remember reading somewhere that at the at the height of the lending boom in uh, in two thousand and eight the, the you could get a loan with something to the effect of Two and a half percent down, right? At at like two or three percent, right? So if you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house, you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house, right? And you're paying what? Two and a half, three percent. You paid three thousand dollars. You paid three thousand dollars on a house. You get to move into that house, and then you never have to make another payment again because foreclosure rates and the the way that you know, at least foreclosure rates now are really high. Beforehand, they, they weren't, but now... It's like the spawn of idiocy. Complete idiocy. Yeah, idiocy. So he's like, we caused all this. We made your life suck. So why are you saving money? Why are you trying to make your position better? You should be out there spending money and getting yourself more into debt so we can make... We can make... We can Ourselves look better. Yeah, exactly. that, we're, that we can actually do a job we're employed to do. Exactly. 
Exactly. Let's continue going. Do you know the American economy is counting on you? We can't count on the rest of the world to spend money on our stuff. <laughs> our stuff is just overpriced, and we can't expect anybody else to buy it. We need, <laughs> we need you to buy it. Our healthcare is the most expensive in the world. Well, I don't know. Well, we'll get to oil in a bit. But our healthcare is extremely expensive. Cars are expensive. It's, it's all very expensive. So <laughs> the rest of the world is in an even worse mood than you are. You should feel lucky that you're not a Greek consumer. <laughs> <laughs> not just mean, I mean. <laughs> yeah. In China, while they're truly struggling, they're just to reach the very modest goal of 7% growth. Yeah, I suppose the, the stock market going up by 500% isn't a bad sign, is it? No, not at all. So the Federal Reserve is counting on you too. Fed officials want to start raising the cost of your borrowing because they worry that they've been giving you a free ride for too long with zero interest rates. But they're they're not going to raise the cost of borrowing because people don't need, want to borrow. They want to save. People want to start actually having money. Yeah, because they're responsible people. Because the fund managers, the idiots in charge of the money, doesn't, don't know how to invest it. Exactly. I mean, obviously, we're hitting or close to new highs with the Dow and with the S&P. But I don't think people will trust it. It's only been seven years. We're not seeing the same exuberance I mean, that we saw in 2008 or 2009. Make, make, make a mistake. Fine. Make the same mistake again, you're an idiot. Make the same mistake a third time, you're just like, I don't have words for it. Because before 2011, I don't think we really had a, a market crash the same mag magnitude. And was it not until 1989? 1989, it was. Yeah. So that was a most people hadn't had experienced. Well, at least the the millennials and the yeah and the. People in the 30s and 40s who've been saving money coming in 2001, 2008. I mean, obviously everybody put 2001 to the effect of, oh, it was the internet, you know, internet boom. We had all these tech companies coming in, you know, new marketplace which we would never opened up before, and obviously a lot of money went, you know, to to bad companies. That 2008 was real estate, and it's just we're getting closer and closer to these these boom and bust being directly attributable to government policies in the Fed. And, you know, this letter is just everything that's wrong with the Fed and everything that we as, as people outside of it need to, to start taking into effect and, and really doing something about it. So let's move on to uh, some of the uh, trading that we've been looking at this week. So uh, one thing that we've been looking at intensely is oil. Uh, we've seen kind of a uh, consolidation of prices ever since, what is it, about a month ago, uh, in the beginning of May. We've seen oil hovering right around 60. It's tested 62, but 62 and a half was the high. We've been testing 62 once or twice. We almost got up there today, uh, and we've had lows probably right in the round 58, 57. So uh, if we look at the preceding several months, we can see that it kind of bottomed out 42, and then we had a you know, 50% gain from there, from oil. And now we kind of be stuck here. We kind of seem to be stuck here. Yeah, I mean, we just don't know, we don't know which way it's going to go. I mean, in terms of this 2.73% down move for the day, um, you know, if we if we look at mathematics, and an average move, expected move for crude oil futures on a day is 2%. Yeah, 2%. So it, it's not quite far off, really. No, oh, and, you know, we're going into Friday with the OPEC meeting, and we're just looking at more indecision here. And... The thing which is worrying for me is that with so much indecision with OPEC, I'm surprised we're not seeing more volatility. Yep. Yeah. So sure. let's let's pull up the options page, right? So right now we're looking at uh, volatility being at 41.58 on the front month for uh, oil futures and 36.27 on the back month. So we take a look at the historic. Where do we get? It? Oh, sorry, options statistics. We take a look at historical IV rank. We're at about thirty-three percent, and it's relatively low. And you know, for as much for as much chatter that there's going on in the oil world, with everything that's happening in uh, Syria and Libya and the United States, with all the fracking taking a hit, I'm surprised there's not more volatility. You know, we're seeing suppliers really being hurt. Uh, you know, Russia's taking a big hit. Uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to drive the market under. Um, I mean, maybe the maybe the price is already built in. I think so. Quite possibly. Maybe, but there's so much tension going on in the world. At least in my perspective, of what I don't know, what I read the news. Iraq is a mess. Syria is a mess. Iran is I don't know, Iran, 
Saudi Arabia. It's an outlier. <laughs> okay, well, the three biggest producers. All right, obviously, Russia's on track. They're producing a ton. Right? The, the issue with Russia is that they don't have storage. Exactly. So they have to sell everything they make, yeah. that they produce at market rate. Yeah. And so these low prices are not good for them. So the Saudis, they, they have massive storage facilities offshore, etc. Yeah. Um, so, so Russia really does feel the pinch. Well, with Russia, it, Russia's able to take... So Russia has one of the lowest production costs for getting the oil out of the ground uh, compared to, I think, only the Saudis uh, have better... Um, uh, was it downstream? <clears throat> Downstream, yeah. yeah, downstream. Yeah. Only the Saudis downstream is is just marginally cheaper than the Russians, and the majority of the Russian cost comes in at the refineries. Uh, the refineries aren't modern; they're they're still lacking. The old, the rusty. Yeah, they're still lacking comparatively to a lot of the more modern refineries in the United States, and in Europe, and in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, one has to think where the money goes to. Exactly. <laughs> but let's not get into that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they are they are embarking on a uh, um, you know revamp of the refinery facilities. Um, I read I read a Luke Oil report. Um, their outlook till twenty twenty five, and they believe that there will be a, a you know a, you know massive sum of investment in the refinery sector in Russia. So I think they are going to become e- even more efficient than they are uh, at, at present. Yeah, but but again, the issue is storage. You know, you've got the uh, I, I believe it's the Bashnet pipeline, yeah. which I think they've got two million barrels which they can hold in there. Which you know, in the grand scheme of things, is nothing really. Yeah. Um, and and they can hold that in a pipeline. You know, outside of that, they pretty much got to flog everything that they get. Yeah, it's the same in the states as well too. So the the states is close to near uh, near record highs. For its supply, and eventually they're just going to run out of places to put it, and they're going to have to sell it at market rates, you know, or well below market rates just to get it out there. Uh, in you know what we've seen in this price rise from forty to sixty-two is you know an increase in the price, but we haven't seen an increase in demand as well too. You know, supply is still at all-time highs, but yet we're seeing the price keep on rising and rising and rising. Yeah, uh, and going into this Friday with the OPEC meeting going on, I don't think there's going to be any consensus. And if they don't find consensus, I think the price is going to take a hit. So I, I think we share the same opinion. Yeah, as well. absolutely. Yeah. So if we wanted to take advantage of this, coming into the options, um, looking at the back month, uh, what's something that we could do, Matt? Well, let's take a look at it. So if we're, if we're doing a bearish play, and me, Sam, I'm not sure what your views on our oil prices, Matt, uh, but me and Sam are bearish over there, especially the medium term, at least anyway. Um, we don't think it's going to end anytime soon. Uh, I I would I would issue a short term price target of fifty two. Um, well, let's say based let's, on the current fundamentals. Let's take a look at the charts. I mean, we're we're at fifty nine right now, right? So at least if we're going to be bearish, we're going to see it coming down and touching fifty six and a half, which are which is our previous low. Yeah. Right. So from there, I mean, if we're looking at fifty two, uh, I mean, we're probably looking at maybe this. This next support level uh, from, from the previous rise, maybe around 54, 54 yeah. yeah, and then maybe coming down to 50 after that. So, it, our first, our first tr- like plan is to try to be at 56 and a half. Yeah. So I mean, the, the way I trade this, my my target would be 56 and a half. Mm-hmm. Now, because we can see that the the current IV percentile is 33, it's low. So there's no way I'm wanting to can be to be going to sell premium on this. Yeah. Okay. Especially as if an OPEC meeting is coming up. Volatility could potentially start to rise, mm-hmm. and we don't want to have that uh, vague or gamma risk in it. Exactly. Okay, so the way I do this here is I basically buy a debit put debit spread, which I'd be buying the sixty dollar put, mm-hmm. okay, and I'd be selling the fifty. What was it? Fifty six. Yeah, fifty six and a half is our price target. I'd be selling the fifty six and a half put so, as well. So that's a. Three and a half dollars. Yeah, three and a half dollars. And we're, we're paying one one dollar thirty four credit. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, let's just put it down to, to one lot again. And I mean, this is in case you don't want to you don't you don't want to use um, oil futures because it is such a large product. It's the largest project yeah. out there. Yeah. So we're we're looking at around four thousand six hundred dollars for a buying power taken up. For one lot of uh, crude oil futures. Crude oil futures. I mean, in terms of this, you're looking at we've got 
43 days in order for crude to get down to 56 and a half mm -hmm. in order to, for us to make max profit. So we can see here that you know the cost of the, the trade is $900. Okay, the max loss we have on this trade is 1340 and our max profit is 2160 yeah, it's, okay. it's pretty good. I mean, it's yeah. almost two to one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we look at the the probability of the crude oil getting down to um, fifty six and a half, okay, it's sixty five percent. I mean, better than 50, now 50. that could also increase with with unexpected news as well. Yeah, and so, that's the, that's to hit max profit. Too, uh, and right? that's hit max profit. Yeah. So even if even if you're hitting what's um, halfway there, so even if halfway hitting, there is one fifty. Yeah, so, we'll spot nine so if, if we're looking at, at making, let's come back here. So if we're only looking to get $1.75 out of it, so if we come down here, so 60, 58 and a half, maybe somewhere around here in this 58 and a half, 58, right? We've got an 80, around an 80% chance of hitting there and hitting 50% max profit. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, a, that's a great trade right there. I mean, one thing I'm doing here is I'm, is I'm capping my risk, but mm -hmm. I'm also capping my potential profit. Yeah. But what I get in return is a probability of knowing is that the probability of me being successful in this trade, exactly. and that's what, what that's what I'm all about. I Perfect. mean, I'm sure you two can agree as experienced traders that it's about living to fight another day. Exactly, it's not about living to fight to, to get the home run. Yeah, you just take a small trade, take a small profit, and you just keep on going, keep on doing over and over and over again. Uh, so let's take a look at our next uh, underlying next stock, right, which is Amazon. So Amazon, let's take a look at the chart. Which I want to say is a complete crazy stock. I mean, oh, if you on. if you look at it from the start of this year, it's 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 value it's forty like percent. It's it's value correctly, right? It's value correctly. We've been in, we've seen a month at four fifty two now, and and it must be a hey, I don't think any stocks value correctly with interest rates as low <laughs> as they are. Okay, yeah, I I agree with you on that one. But uh, the a stock is a stock is always going to be valued correctly, right? It's only it's only not valued correctly when the price changes. <laughs> Well, okay, <laughs> subjective, <laughs> devil's advocate here. Yeah. Uh, so what we've seen with Amazon is two huge price rises since, what is that, that's the January. All right, so from January to March, we saw a 30% 30% increase, and then from January until now, uh, we saw, we've seen a 50%, or 53.8% uh, increase, with the max being at about almost 60%. So we've seen a huge year on year to date profit now, for Amazon. Now I want to put this into context. If we take the probability, okay, of Amazon increasing another fifty percent from today, oh. okay, in half a year. I don't think we do that. I mean, I'm not even sure if the, the option change would allow us to do that. Yeah. But let's take another half a year. Let's take until what, October? Uh, let's just go a year out. Let's go a year out, okay, January. Year. Um so an extra twenty an extra an extra fifty percent is two hundred and eighteen dollars. Yeah. So we're so we're going to you know like six seventy here almost. I mean well, even it's not even on there. <laughs> I mean look at this. I mean even to get to six fifty is five point two seven percent. I mean yeah. I think that just puts it in context of how ridiculous this, this move actually is. Yeah. I mean I'm sure if we went on to analyze or something for example, um, let's just move, remove some of this. Yeah, just type in Amazon up here. Now, if Sam actually picks the date, okay, if we go into add simulated like trades. No, 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 let's go into add simulated trades. Now, let's go into the date here. Um, the date, let's go back to the start. So, when did it make first make its move? Let's go oh, to like January. January. Right, first of the first, 20th of the first. I should at this point mention I sold on the 1st of May. Catching. Chain. It's a good move. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move this. Should I put this? Put, which one? Completely get rid of that, that whole lot. So. Does it have a thing to go down? Yeah, sure. Oh, right. This yeah. one. Yeah, just, just drag it down a bit more. Yeah, I got it. Let's just take this down. Now let's change these to probability of touch. Uh, right. Last. Okay. It's a nice probability of touch. Okay so, okay, okay, so the date we should be on now uh, is 1.2015. Is 1.2015. What's the current price? 4.32, so I'm not quite sure it's worked there. Wait, is it supposed to... January 15. Mm. Oh, okay, so sorry, let me just check. Think back. Ah, 
There we go. If you can change the price there to the first sum, yeah, so let's just go. Let's go back to January. January twentieth. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, it's just going to load. Let's pull this bracket down here. Okay, and let's take it from January to take it July. Let's take it to July. July Not the minis. Minutes. Change. It, yeah, let's go to the big guys. Now change it to probability for touch, and we probably want to bring this down a bit more as well. Yeah, the graph down. Yeah, that's a don't need the graph. Bring the other thing down as well. Uh, let's do all the strikes. The probability of. Can you do probability of touch? Touch. Right. Okay. So Apple was at 289. Okay. This okay. And now it's at 432. So let's go straight down to 432. Oh, man. So the probability at the start of this year of Apple going up by 50%, getting to where it is now, was 7%. Oh. 6%. 7%. Which is just crazy. It's ridiculous. So essentially, if you want to put it, Apple has already moved a more than a two standard deviation move for six months. I met that guy who went back and bought it. Profit loss day looks good today. What is today? The 3rd, 4th of June. Take a third. Let's just take it. Whoa, man! One contract would have. The lucky guy who bought one of those contracts back then made about thirteen thousand dollars and be held on until until. About I today. mean, it's ridiculous. It's yeah. That just puts it into context that that had a six percent chance of happening. Yeah, that's how you turn one dollar into thirteen thousand dollars. <laughs> so, what we were looking at today, at least this morning, before Apple made its five five point move, um, is you know even though the stock's gone up a lot, we're still bullish on it. Yeah. Now, regardless of my speed of just slamming Amazon for the past five minutes, I still over the very short term, I'm still bullish on it. Mm -hmm. I think that it can it has the potential to come up and retest the highs. Oh, of course. Of of four hundred and fifty two. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let us just run you through the trade that we placed this morning. Um, we placed a series of trades on the sixteen days to go into the expiration. Let's take the strikes out. So, yeah, so this morning uh, we were looking at 4.30, but it, yeah. it pretty much jumped up to 4.35. But let's just replicate what we did. So eff yeah. effectively what we did is we had, let's say we had 10 contracts that were maximum to be committed mm -hmm. towards the trade. Mm -hmm. Okay, what we did is we started off by purchasing five of one in the money, one out the money. Yep, because we're looking at pretty much an IV percentile rank of... Four right now, which is incredibly low. So historical volatility just, five. Yeah. So there's just no point in selling premiums. So what we did is we put fifty percent into effectively what is a fifty fifty percent play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now if we bring this down to one, down yeah. to one. Yeah. One. Let's go into confirm and send. Yeah. Sense. We're actually, you know, it's kind of a 50 50 risk to reward ratio. It's still okay. So, what we did is we put 50% of it into quite a modest conservative play. Mm -hmm. And then, what we also did is we did around, you know, 435 to the 445. Yeah. 445. Which was 340. 440. Maybe 440, 440. That's fine. Yeah. Which was, which was um, two and a half. Yeah, which, which, we did, which we did three of them. Yeah. Okay, so let's go and confirm and send. Let's bring it down to three. Well, you know, it's again, it's just a, it's, it's around 50 50, just over 50 50 yeah, percent, which is nice. Right and, then we, and then we went to 452. Uh, and you know, 445, right? We did one, uh, which we're, again, we're looking a little bit, a little bit higher profit, which means yeah. a little bit more risk. Uh, but we're still looking at only, you know, pretty much one to one. Uh, and then we did 450, which is our price target. Yep. And doing that, we have, I believe it's one to two, so we risk 573 to make 927. Yeah. So it's almost it's almost one to two. So we're looking, it's a pretty good trade right there, especially Absolutely. if we're bullish about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if over the 16 days, if we're going to get to 450, but... Uh, we yes, Amazon has got 50% in six months, so yeah, yeah, and it, anything's possible. But to I mean, me, that's a good risk to reward ratio on a trade. I mean, with, based on applied volatility, we're looking at 17 points. Over the next 16 days, mm -hmm. so uh, which is easily doable. Yeah, so we're looking to go from 435 to 442 and a half. Yeah, is the expected move and yeah. that, one standard deviation move. Um, <clears throat> so the trade of the day, 
which we were looking at and which we're all really excited about is with a company called JD. Now, JD is a uh, Chinese uh, online manufacturing or online kind of retail store. Uh, looked into it a little bit. It's got a small market cap of, actually, I think it's pretty big, maybe 170 million. Yeah. Uh, and this billion. is more of a momentum play as well. Mm -hmm. And by simply just looking at the price action of what was going on in the stock price. As you pointed out earlier, Sam, you know, the stock price had made a big move up, yeah. consolidation, a huge move up by you know fifty percent or so, and now it's just making another consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, and and when a stock's made a move like this and it consolidates, and buyers keep on coming in, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're expecting the stock to go higher. Yeah, exactly. And that's the play we made today. Yeah. So we're we're looking for to at least test its its previous highs. So at least get to about thirty seven is thirty seven. Yeah. Yep. So let me before you go through your sum, let me quickly quickly run you through the way I I set up this trade today. Mm -hmm. um, so what we actually did on JD is between between the current price and its high. Okay, is let's say two dollars. I went along the side and looked for the two dollar expected move. Yep. Okay, which is you can either take. 16 day one okay and what I did first of all was I bought simply debit spreads okay of 34.50 and 36 because I know that's 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 the expected move yeah I mean why why not why not you know you're playing it to what the market makers expecting the stock to go um, okay yeah it can go down eight dollars but our direction assumption is up mm -hmm. so I placed a debit spread on that and you know, that's a, a risking one to make a 1.25. That's pretty good. You know, that, that's good enough for me. Yeah, that's pretty that's Absolutely. Really good. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's another play that we were talking about doing earlier when if we're ever going to buy outright co options, calls or puts, we like to finance that by selling puts as well. Yeah. So another way I did was I actually bought the Delta 70. Okay. I had 10 contracts that I was going to be, for example, I had 10 contracts I was willing to place in this. Mm -hmm. Take one, right? So, yeah, so let's put let's put it up to two. So I actually bought two Delta seventy, mm -hmm. okay, doing a two dollars thirty five per contract. Yeah, so that's going to be what? So it's four seven four eighty four, four, four seven four seventy. Yeah, so we're looking at four hundred and seventy dollars uh, for these Delta seventy contracts. Yeah, so I'm paying four hundred and seventy dollars for that. Okay, so what I did also, okay, so is that, that means that if we move up from thirty five. That's by strike price, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so if we move up from thirty-five to thirty-seven, well, we're going to make about a dollar fifty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, obviously, in order between now and the, in sixteen days' time, the stock price needs to move from its current price two dollars thirty-five extra in order mm -hmm. for us to break even. Yeah. Um, but so, so we're looking at a break-even price of uh, five, thirty-five, thirty or thirty-five, thirty-five. Yeah. So. What I did to finance this, so I paid four hundred seventy. So I paid four dollars seventeen in, in debit. Mm -hmm. So what I did to finance this was I know the IV percentile is low. Really low. Okay, but what I did is I paid for eight of these, which takes me up to my to my ten overall. Okay, and that's twenty cents credit. That's mm -hmm. one dollar sixty. So you're getting one dollar sixteen yeah. credit. So I'm creating one dollar sixteen credit, and $1. I mean credit, and you're paying two dollars thirty five. So uh, you have about seventy five cents that you've, you've paid there. Yeah. Um, so Overall for the call up. Yeah, for the call up. Which is it, it's a brilliant play because what you're doing, you are safeguarding yourself, but also giving you the chance to to hit that home run and and buying that lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of financing buying that lottery ticket. With collecting premium as well, mm -hmm. which I think is an exceptional play. Yeah, yeah it sounds pretty good. Um, now we we really like this. We feel really good about JD, and we're hoping to see some good price action. Hopefully, the next few days. I mean, yeah, it's always good to get it, price action closer to when you <laughs> to when you buy the options. Absolutely, than, yeah. than further away, just so you don't have to worry about theta decay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, we'll see a move in the next couple of days. Yeah. I mean, what are we looking at? Today, I mean, it's a little bit choppy, but it's definitely choppy day. yeah. We're looking, we're looking at kind of a, a trend starting to move upwards. Yeah. Uh, if we can keep on that, maybe we'll get some big movements here in the next few yeah. days. Now, I wanted to show you something before we move quickly on. Is I wanted to show you a stock that popped up on my radar today, and it's EMC. 
I've been looking at EMC. Now, as we know, we are contra contrarian traders. Yeah. Okay, and we like to, to if we're going to buy stocks, we like to buy stocks in the majority of the time mm -hmm. when they've been hit. Yeah. Okay, and guys, this is kind of a textbook example of how to invest into you know maybe um, low low price stocks and relative to the market. And this is how actually a lot of hedge funds and a lot of traders actually actually invest. But it's so so simple. So what you see here is EMC's price. I'm sure everybody knows what a trend line is. If not, you know, just just Google it. It'll tell you within 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. What it's done here is it's identified that the stock's been in a downtrend. Okay, and it's found support in this whole range here of between 25 and 25.75. Yeah. Okay, and what it's done today is it's broken through this descending trend line. Okay, which tells me that this downtrend is over, and it's due for a relief rally. Okay, so I was actually looking to buy this today. So for another example of how this works, it's actually Tesla. Okay, if you do the same thing on Tesla, and you connect the high, when Tesla broke out, you see it went from 203 to, to 248, wow. which is a 40% you know, increase there. So I'm not saying that EMC is going to make a 40% increase, but you can see how I like they are. And exactly. that's why I took a, bit, a very bullish position that today as well. And you could definitely see a bit of a pullback as well too, which would be a better time to get into it. And Absolutely. Then just keep on going up. Um, what else were we looking at today? Um, another one that we were looking at is MYL, which kind of had the same pattern as, uh, as JD. And we were seeing kind of a, a nice slow ride, well not so slow, but we had a big big gain here and we've just seen consolidation making a cup and handle pattern and we're looking for further uh, bullish trends from the stock. Yeah, uh, at least going. test its new high again. Yeah, exactly. So that's going up from 72 where it is now to yeah. 76. That's yeah. a four point move at least that we're looking for. Uh, kind of same pattern, you know, same sort of like same sort of trade that you can make with it that we made before. Yeah. And let's pull up the US dollar sum. Oh, right, yeah. This was... This is, Incredible that what we saw. And so, this has been whipsawing around <clears throat> recently as well, especially, mm -hmm. you know, it's been, and we know that um, Europe's in, in quantitative easing. We know there's problems with, with Greece as well and uncertainty about the euro. Yeah. Um, so you can see, you know, especially the, the most recent move, which has luckily enough to catch on and, and took 200 pips out of the trade. Yeah. Um, we can see the whipsawing around of the euro here. Yeah, let's take a look at it. Let's get down to a four hour chart so it's a bit more clear. So, this this is the the big move that we saw yesterday. Exactly. I mean, and if I can interrupt you one more time, sorry. And this the the play that I showed you a minute ago, the pattern it happens exactly here as well. Okay, the trend line's descending, so the euro. That's, that's, that's a big move down. That's, that's a big move down, and the euro is coming down, and it broke through the trend line. And as soon as it came back down to test the trend line, that's when I bought. And you can see what happened here. It, I took two hundred pips out of the trade. Yeah, yeah, it was a big move. And then it went another hundred pips after that. Another hundred pips. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, th th these moves aren't no aren't abnormal within the currency market because, yeah. especially more recently, because of you know, these kind of rip your head off rallies. You know, so many people are short the euro dollar. Mm -hmm. It's probably over 65, 60 percent of people who are short. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when there's going to be a rally, it's going to rip your head off. Yeah. So you need to be careful of that. Yeah, definitely. And we also saw a, a huge rally. In the actually price breakout in USD JPY the other day, um, so here it is. We've seen huge consolidation from when was this uh, from the beginning of the year. Essentially, it came up to about 120 and just stayed there for uh, about five months. And then at kind of the middle of last month, we started seeing a huge move, and we've seen, what is that, that's from 119 all the way up to 124 Absolutely, now. and I'll show you exactly the way that I'd play this. If we take this onto a daily chart here, um, a very a, another very simple simple way is from, from the top here, from the high, you could do a simple trend line to draw, to do these, mm -hmm. okay, and you could actually do one here to create a wedge pattern. Now, any trader who's listening to here knows it's a very ineffective, it's a very effective and powerful move. So when the, the, the US dollar yen broke, I mean, Sam actually bought this here, yeah. okay, and we actually rode it up, we're out of the position now, but we actually rode it up on the close of the above trend line, and we managed to ride it up to, up to around the 123 region. Yeah, it's so it's, it's a perfectly good, you know, 
wedge pattern formation here, which shows how powerful these things can be. So obviously, what's going on with the currency markets is great stuff. Uh, we've seen some good trades in the past few days, but the most important news of the day has been with Seth Blatter. Seth Blatter? Blatter? Seth, I, I don't think anybody knows his name. I mean, Seth Blatter. Seth the, the Blatter? The, the, the Blatter. The Blatinator. The Blatmeister. Yeah, well, yeah. things have gotten a bit leaky at, uh, at FIFA in the past few days. And uh, Blatter's like, forgot to take his medicine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now people are going to go to jail. Well, or more bribes are going to no, have to be paid. No, no, no. People have the prospect of going to jail. Yeah, I mean, I'm, people I'm, with money don't go to jail. I mean, in my opinion, I think you should be sent to a, a jail over here in Russia and see what it, it's like in a real jail. They give him, they give him a trophy here. I mean, he brought the World, or not the World Cup, World Cup. Yeah, World Cup. Yeah, yeah World Cup. Twenty eighteen World Cup. Yeah. Putin, Putin probably put him up in one of the big matches. Well, here. well, Putin's going to be sweating because he spent a fair amount on uh, on regeneration costs. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I can't imagine them being. Have you seen the state? What they've been doing? Yeah, yeah. They've been, they've they re, re, they've been rebuilding up in the whole lot. Yeah. And, and in Qatar, they've been building, what, I don't know, maybe 10 new stadiums Next. with air conditioning, roofs, the whole lot. 2026 is going to be on the moon, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I mean, the, I don't buy the fact that they're going to redo the votes or, the, or, or they're going to look back over because, uh, you know, financially, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for them to do so. Or maybe in because Canada. The, 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 the compensation that they're going to have to pay um, as an organisation to the countries uh, to whom the, um, they gave these tournaments to, it is just not going to be financially viable to do a recap. Now, that's not to say that you know finances should come before morality, but you, you know at the end of the day, does FIFA want to pay out five? Yeah billion dollars I think we should I think before to cover the cost of the stadiums that they've just started building on the fact that FIFA gave them the World Cup. I think before 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 we say that about not giving compensation we should check all the other FIFA um, officials bank offshore bank accounts <laughs> to see the actual value of that. I mean it wouldn't surprise me if it amounted to a few billion. <laughs> well 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 yeah but I mean as an organisation you you know any organisation in the world is is uh, you know, their stakeholders are the most important thing. And, that, and I don't think anybody benefits from a recount other than England and everybody else who lost out of those, um, uh, those bidding processes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, sh should Russia have got the World Cup? No. Should Qatar have got the World Cup? No. But they've got it now. Grin, bear it, get on with it. Um, and uh, and find, a, find a viable way to make it work. Well, who's to say that Brazil didn't... didn't uh, donate some money for the World and, Cup as well too. And, and who's to say that Uruguay didn't donate for the 1936 World Cup? But you, you, you know, the, these things are done. They're gone. It is, you know, for the most part set in stone. Um, I, I, and all we can do is learn from the process. Mm -hmm. And and you know, the the next World Cup, what is it, 2026? 20, North Korea. Yeah, Pyongyang. Pyongyang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pyongyang World Cup. Yeah. You, you know, we've, we've exposed what's been exposed. Yes, there were payments to South Africa. Can we take the World Cup back? No. no. And, you know, same with Russia. Yeah, Russia probably has proved a few people. Win with the first thing. And, you know, same with Qatar. But, you know, un unfortunately, that has been a part of life under FIFA and under Sir Plato. I mean, so much for the US police in the world, I think. I mean, they, they one thing for sure is they love a good witch hunt. Yeah, we do. Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't believe that the FBI are sniffing around Seb Blatter as a result of they don't want to go to Qatar for, the, for you know, for a couple of weeks. And um, there's obviously ulterior motives at play. Um, what they are, I don't know, but but they've obviously got dirt on Blatter. Um, he's a seventy-nine-year-old man, mind you. He's not going to jail. He's not going to jail. Yeah, oh, I mean, he's. The, he, He's a 79-year-old rich man. Yeah. I mean, how many 79-year-old rich men do you have in jail? Not many. Not many. Not many. No. And, um, you know, he'll probably develop a heart condition in the next year and he'll be uh, you right. know, exonerated and, and not have to appear in a court. But, you know, that, that's the whether, whether that heart pain's instigated or not is a completely different matter. Yeah, you know, he'll probably, he'll probably show up with an oxygen tank and a wheelchair in the, in the courtroom. Is know, it, is that's, there any, that's what happens, right? Can you short FIFA? 
<laughs> if only FIFA was listed, I tell you what, there'd be some volatility in there. <laughs> yeah. I said the IV percentile would be like 100, 120 <laughs> yeah. of the historical IV. Yeah, that'd be good to hear from you listeners as well too. Is can we short FIFA and how we do that and what would the trade be? Yeah, if, if you can have a FIFA arbitrage, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's bullish on FIFA who's listening, I'll take the opposite side of your trade every single day. <laughs> so with that... We're just going to leave it. We'll be back in a few days uh, with some more commentary and uh, trades for you guys. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys again soon. And then if, if anyone bumps into Jamie Diamond on, the, on, on, your, on your travels, ask him how, you re, how he reduces his cost basis for his clients. Yeah, we'll get to cost basis next week. Uh, he's worth a billion, remember. Yeah, so I'm Sam, and... I'm Matt. And, and I'm also Matt. The, the Scottish one. The Scottish one. Yeah, the enlightened one. The enlightened one. Uh, thanks for listening to Traders Insight. We'll see you next week.